Welcome to Post Mortar, the show where I give an illustrated look into the history of brick and mortar stores of the past. Today, we're looking at the Midwestern Venture Stores discount chain. One that a lot of people may not know, but had a lasting mark on the discount retail industry. The year is 1962. John Geis, a World War II veteran, had retired as a lieutenant commander and worked his way up the ladder to senior vice president and general merchandise manager at the Dayton Company. Together with late founder George Dayton's grandson, Douglas, Geis co-founded and launched Target Stores and put Geis's concepts on full display. By 1968, Target would soon expand into Missouri, with two new stores opened in St. Louis. That same year, Geis would resign. The May Company, a St. Louis-based company, which at the time was known for chains such as Hecht's, Kaufman's, and Famous and Bar, saw massive growth during the 50 years prior, with several acquisitions of stores and chains. By the time Target entered the St. Louis area, May was in an antitrust settlement with the Department of Justice, under which they were unable to acquire any more chains. 1968 would mark profits at $1 billion, the highest in the company's history. However, the next year would see a drop to around $36.2 million. This put them in a position where they couldn't just buy into the rising discount trend, but had to raise profits. They needed an internalized concept. When Dave Babcock, now the May Company's executive vice president, learned that Geis had resigned, he got in touch with him and got him involved in May's conceptual conundrum. Starting a new discount retailer was going to be a big job, and with his experience developing and rolling out Target nationally, Geis was the obvious man for the job. The two met to discuss the idea in depth. Both being true innovators in their respective areas of retail business, the plan would be set up for success. John then made a presentation to May's executive committee, and after some deliberation, the group would decide to go ahead with the new concept, titled Venture Stores. Heavily modeled after Target, and would take cues from other chains like Kmart, Walmart, and the discount model pioneer, Corvette. The first Venture Store opened in 1970 in the Overland suburb of St. Louis, on Page Avenue. Venture was given a very recognizable black and white logo, which could rival the stark, solid red Target logo now dotting America's shopping centers. The interior actually featured somewhat of the opposite. Once inside, customers were met with a colorful burnt orange color scheme. This first location was extremely successful, and Venture would open 20 more by 1976, by which point they had around 10 locations in Missouri, 4 in Kansas, and 6 in Illinois. May then purchased 23 turnstile locations from Jewel Food Stores and converted them to Venture, and they would grow to over 40 locations in the Chicago area. May's strategy was relatively straightforward. Venture would purchase inventory in bulk at reduced prices. It would sell the goods in an environment that, compared to department stores, was low budget. By emphasizing self-service, volume sales, and a small operating budget, the store would be able to appeal to customers by offering low prices. That same year, John Geis would leave Venture Stores and joined Indianapolis-based Airway Stores, where he would take over as chairman and turn the company around from the brink of bankruptcy. Discount retail became extremely competitive, but under the leadership of Julian Searman, the chain would see large growth during the late 70s and throughout the 80s. During the U.S. recession of the early 80s, lowered consumer spending became an issue. Industry consolidation became a big problem as well, with Walmart and Kmart buying up competition to raise profits. This would push Venture to accept a lower price margin, and while the rise of competition pushed chains like Corvettes into bankruptcy, Venture would thrive as they became the lowest cost discounter in the country. They had become a Midwestern staple. By 1985, Venture had a fleet of over 50 stores, most in the Chicago and St. Louis metro areas. Over the next five years, they would open around six stores annually. In a $2.2 billion merger, May would acquire Associated Dry Goods, which controlled brands such as Lord & Taylor, L.S. Ayers, Sticks Baron Fuller, one of their major competitors, as well as Caldor, which consisted of around 100 stores in the Northeast. That year, Venture would expand into Kentucky, and by 1990, operated around 80 stores in 8 states. To the surprise of many, 
May would sell off its discount divisions. With a bigger foothold in Chicago with the acquisition of Lord & Taylor, they didn't really need Venture as much as before. They would abandon Caldor and spin off Venture into its own private organization. Being sent off with a sizable debt, some believed that Venture would suffer out of May's control, while others said the chain would finally be able to freely expand, no longer being held down while May focused on their department stores. I believe that it could have been beneficial had Venture been able to expand more rapidly under the protection of May, but in their current position, it would prove to be dangerous. Searman, now CEO of the reassembled Venture, would continually add stores as he aggressively expanded the chain into Texas, their ninth state, opening 11 new stores there and boosting their total store count to 104. He would streamline company operations, outlining initiatives that Venture needed to obtain to stay competitive and drive costs down. One was to upgrade warehouse and distribution operations with new technology, and Venture sales would soar to $1.8 billion in 1992. But as sales would rise, the rate of improvement would slow, and competition would threaten their success. In 1993, while Venture was focused on expansion, they lost their grasp on their core markets. Despite this, they continued to grow ambitiously and would spend hundreds of millions in construction and renovation and would plan to open 10 stores annually throughout the 90s, most of which would be in Texas. Venture would also begin selling their properties and then leasing them back. Robert Wildrick would step up as chairman and CEO and would lead the company as they made a last-ditch effort to modernize over 90 of their stores with a rebranding to make themselves able to compete with leading companies like Kohl's, which modeled the upscale discount concept well. Wildrick described this as a movement to a format focusing on offering an assortment of high-quality home, family, and leisure merchandise at low prices. Focus on clothing and removal of consumable products would see a large drop in store traffic. This would be cited as one of their biggest mistakes, as well as not staying competitive in advertising. It was clear that the Texas expansion was a big mistake, and Venture would sell the stores to Kmart and would close their Texas distribution center. Wildrick dismissed any rumors of bankruptcy and insisted that the company could still turn things around, but their debt said otherwise. The company's net worth plummeted, and initiatives to boost sales didn't pan out. Their market dominance was tied strongly to their pre-built discount empire, and they just didn't innovate enough before these issues became so prominent. Finally, Venture would enter Chapter 11 bankruptcy, and attempt to operate under a smaller number of stores. However, these efforts wouldn't help heal the chain. The damage was already done. On April 27, 1998, they would announce that the company would be closing all operations. Remaining venture stores would subsequently be taken over by Kmart, Shopco, Kohl's, and Burlington Coat Factory. And some locations to this day would remain abandoned. The venture stores had their place in their era, and heck, if management had stayed competitive and took a more rapid expansion approach earlier, they could very well still be a major discount player today. Where they'd innovated before, they let a lot crumble in the long run. In the early days, they truly were ahead of Kmart in other chains, but they just didn't stay relevant. For John Geis, he died of a heart attack in 1992 at the age of 71. He was really a legend, and innovated in the retail world many times over. Right up there with his pal, Sam Walton.